अंजनी हाँ सर डीजी साहब ज्वाइन किया आपके ज्वाइन मैसेज में दे दिया फोन भी किया हूँ कर रहे हैं कि ज्वाइन कर रहा हूँ समबडी इज देयर रेड ज्वाइन रेड ज्वाइन रेड ज्वाइन बिद्दी नेम रेडी का नो 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 सर रेड ज्वाइन अच्छा ये ज्वाइन अंडर विच नेम सुनन कर लिया जो हम सुनन कर लिया कर लिया यस यस नाउ ये ज्वाइन यस यू कैन मेक इट आफ होम यस आई आई सी आई सी अर्पित कैन यू मेक डॉक्टर जॉन एज कोहस्ट जे ओ एच एन डन सर थैंक यू थैंक यू आई एम वेटिंग फॉर डी डॉक्टर महापात्रा इज ऑल्सो ज्वाइनिंग हाँ जी आवाज आ रही है हाँ आ रही है सर ये सब ज्वाइन नहीं है अभी हाँ कर रहे हैं सर वो फोन आया था उनका Uh, so I think uh, let him join and we can start. Uh, Doctor John, uh, can we start? Can we start? Uh, are Are you ready? Uh, ah, yeah, yeah, I'm ready. Okay, thank you, thank you. I'm waiting for Doctor Mahapatra. Okay, but uh, no problem. We can start and he can uh, join. So, uh, friends, uh, welcome back to this important lecture series. Uh, the seventy-five uh, lecture series of Indian Council of Agriculture Research uh, for a very important uh, cause, and that is uh, to celebrate the successful seventy-five years of independence of our great country, India. Uh, many great personalities they have uh, delivered lectures. Till date, uh, Dr. John, we have completed around fifty-four lectures, and today is your fifty-fifth lecture. We have to complete seventy-five uh, lectures. and these topics have been on a very uh, uh, very areas uh, not only on the agricultural research uh, policies uh, the covid um, uh, motivational lectures uh, the the yoga and many many more things and in the same series uh, we th thank you for accepting our invitation uh, on another important area uh, and uh, that is the transforming global food systems after covid 19 a very important uh, point for all of us to understand that how uh, we have to meet this challenging and what kind of transformation is required uh, friends uh, for the uh, dr john is a very uh, known personality in the area of policies uh, dr john swinen is the director general of the international food policy research institute ifpri uh, we have lot of collaborations with ifpri Uh, and the global director of the systems transformation science group at cgir so double responsibility he has got uh, dr swinen has published 
extensively on agricultural and uh, food policies, international development, uh, political economy, institutional reforms, trade, and global value chains. He holds leadership roles for various uh, trans forces, uh, including the Food Systems Economics Commission and the uh, Think 20 Task Force on Climate Change, Sustainable Energy, and Environment. Uh, prior to joining this IFPRI and the CGIR, Dr. Sunen was Professor and Director of the uh, LACOS Center for Institutions and Economic Performance at KU Leuven, led economist at the World Bank, economic advisor to many international institutes, and guest professor at several universities, including Stanford University's Center for Food Security and the Environment. Dr. Sunen earned his PhD from Cornell University and holds honorary doctorates from University of Göttingen and the Slovak University of Agriculture. He is a fellow of the Agriculture and Applied Economic Association and the European Association of Agricultural Economists and served as president of International Association of Agriculture Economists. Uh, Dr. John, I can just tell you this platform uh, is being shared today by our many vice chancellors of agricultural universities, our many deputy director generals of the Indian Council of Agriculture Research, our secretary, Dr. Uh, Mohapatra, uh, senior uh, faculty of the universities, other senior staff uh, of uh, ICR, many directors of ICR institutes, uh, they are joining this uh, important lecture. So this uh, lecture series has become very important. And thank you once again for accepting our invitation. Uh, Dr. Mohapatra, our uh, secretary there and DG ICR has also joined. So uh, thank you on behalf of the Indian Council of Agriculture Research for agreeing to deliver this important lecture. The, uh, with the permission of the chair, uh, Dr. Mohapatra, who is going to chair this session, uh, I request you now to take the floor and deliver your talk. Over to you, Dr. John, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for this very kind introduction. Uh, thank you also for setting the scene on the importance of this lecture series and uh, I am I'm truly honored to be invited here uh, to be able to um, make a contribution in our current uh, review of the, the global uh, food security situation in the light of a number of changes that have uh, taken place uh, over a longer term and over a shorter period. I have prepared a set of slides. Uh, can I have the first slide please? <clears throat> Is uh, I sent them through earlier. The organizer said it was fine for the. Anjini, who is sharing slides? Uh, John, who is sharing your slides? I thought I sent them through the colleagues, I think from the FP office, who were going to connect them to you. I thought I can uh, try if I can upload them from here. Just... Uh, Arpit, can you make Jyotsna uh, as the co-host? Jyotsna Dua. Anjani, okay. Yes. Jyotsna Dua? Yes. There we are. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. <clears throat> so we are the previous one, please. 
Uh, so, or oh, this is fine, it's fine. So this is a cover of The Economist of June 2013. So this is roughly, it's a bit more than a year ago. Uh, it's actually nine years ago. And so the, the cover of The Economist and the lead story there was really about, we are moving towards the end of poverty. So we had a growth in, uh, in we've seen economic growth for a very serious uh, um, period of time. And uh, my slides are moving a bit fast here, but um, yeah, perfect. Uh, for uh, really about 20, 30 years. And so the story is really about um, this is going to be the end of, uh, of poverty. If you look on the right hand side, these are numbers about malnutrition, about hunger. They go very much in the same way. If you look both at the number of, of people that are hungry in the world, undernourished, and the, and the share of the population, both continue to decline. And the decline starts about 20 years before that already. And this goes roughly on, on the right hand side until 2015, the middle of next decade. And then what we see is a very remarkable thing. Things turn around. Next slide, please. So we've seen that afterwards, the growth of um, the basically the very significant decline in, 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 uh, in hunger and malnutrition is disappearing. In fact, first it's stabilized and then it's growing. And this is very worrisome. And the question, of course, is, is this a hiccup on, on, on our way to ending poverty and hunger, or is it a significant a structural change in the wrong direction. Next slide, please. The, if we look at the more broader perspective um, from foods, uh, in terms of food systems, our food systems transformation, the transition that we want to make, it is even more complicated and in a way more challenging because then we not only look at reduction in, in, uh, in hunger, in poverty, but we also look at the impact on health, the impact of our food system on resilience, on inclusiveness, on sustainability, and of course, on efficiency, and the challenges are even larger than the ones if we just look at undernourishment. Next slide, please. Um, here we see that this change in, um, in or the reversal is uh, what we see at the world level is actually happening in all the main uh, regions in the world. It's happening in Africa, it's happening in, in Asia, it's happening in Latin America and the Caribbean, okay? So it's not concentrated in one part of the world, it's a, it's a global phenomenon. Next slide, please. The, um, so what we see then, if we're gonna look at some of the uh, a broader definition of, of, of malnutrition, uh, next slide, please. Then we see that if we look that many people cannot beyond being hunger, if we look a bit of a broader perspective, we know that uh, a much larger share of the world cannot afford a healthy diet. They have a major micronutrient deficiency up to 2 billion people. We're also now up to 2 billion people who are overweight or obese. And then of course, we have a very significant uh, group of countries in the world, and those are represented on the left hand side on, on, the, on the global map, which face both the problems of too much and too little, in the sense of they face both significant issues related with undernutrition and overweight within the same countries. Next slide, please. On the, if we then look at the issue of, of sustainability, there we also see that our food system, agriculture, but, but not just agriculture, but beyond it, and also the, the trade in food, the retail sector, the processing, etc. If we look at that, the food system as a whole, we see that the impact on, on, on the climate change is much broader than previously recognized and certainly previously recognized in the policy debate, I think. So the food system consumes a large share of the energy in the world and it contributes a large share of greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions going forward. And you see that the colors of the parts on, on the left-hand columns differ a bit in the sense that, for example, livestock production is contributing 2% uh, to energy consumption, but 8% to greenhouse gas emission, okay? And so clear, and for example, the processing and distribution is the other way around, but clearly the sizes are, 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 are substantial and certainly taken together, they really contribute a very large part. And that means that the food system is, is, is part of the problem, but of course, if we can solve it, it could also be a very important part of the solution going forward, both in terms of, of uh, resource use and uh, in terms of uh, greenhouse uh, gas emission and climate change. Let's take a, a little bit, uh, a brief look on what has changed that which has potentially contributed to this turnaround. Next slide, please. 
The one thing where economists look first is, of course, when you look at, at hunger, you look at income. And so here you see that there is a significant correlation between the, the turnaround in the undernourishment data and the development of GDP growth per capita in low and middle income countries, and particularly in the in Africa. Okay, so there was very there was quite significant growth in Africa, maybe not by Indian or Chinese standard, but certainly by historical uh, African standards, up to the middle of next century. Uh, next sorry, last decade. But since then, this has declined very significantly. It has declined on average in, in many countries. Okay, and that has certainly contributed. Another factor, and this is related to the income growth, and this is um, data from uh, Keith uh, Fuglieb, and it's represented in, in or used by Uma Lele in her new book. Next slide, please. Is uh, This looks at, inc at, the, at TFP growth in the world across the different regions. Previous one, where the, we have the T TFP growth. And there you saw that uh, basically the slowdown. Can I have the previous slide, please? So on the left hand, yeah, thank you. On the left hand panel there, you see this is a long, uh, long run period, it's about 50, 60 years. And you see the red line at the bottom is Sub-Saharan Africa. So that's the same area where you see income has gone down and TFP there has stabilized over the last um, uh, couple of years. Uh, in, that, in this way, um, South Asia has done much better. That's the dark uh, green line there. And you see that their TFP growth has been significant over the last uh, 20 years really and continue to grow, Okay, which is uh, good news for the region, I think. Next slide. Obviously, climate change has played a role. This is, I just put the slide in because I cannot <laughs> not talk about it. It's really been, it has really picked up in the last uh, decade and you see the structural shift and clearly this is contributing both directly but also importantly indirectly to the problems of, of uh, food security or food insecurity better. Next slide, please. Uh, one thing which is uh, possibly a bit less well known is, is this one here. And here you see this, this is the, the, the indicator for the people who have to leave their houses because of conflict, their houses, their villages. Um, sometimes they can stay in the country but move to different regions. Sometimes they move internationally. It's the forcibly displaced people worldwide. And you see that number has, has doubled really in the last decade from around 40 million uh, people to uh, about 80 million people. And this is, of course, very much contributing to acute food insecurity compared to uh, some of the more structural reasons. Next slide, please. So the next slide summarizes an, uh, results from uh, last year's global, the, the global food crisis uh, report, uh, crisis report. And there you see that this focuses on, on a more limited indicator. It's, it's the, the crisis situation. So food crises are worse. And, and so there's an indicator for that. And in uh, 2020, there were roughly uh, 155 million people. And so here's the three uh, factors which play a very important role in that. It's, it's the conflict or the insecurity. I just referred to weather events, climate, okay, and, and other weather shocks. And there are the economic shocks, and particularly in the last year, uh, these were in 2020, this was strongly related to, to COVID. And you see the, the impact of the economic shocks actually increased very strongly over the 2018, where it was around 10 million, 2019, more than 20 million, and 2020, more than 40 million pe uh, people affected by it. So that's it, really a very strong growth. But in any case, the impact of all three is very significant. In the title to the slide, I refer this now as the, the three C's, the, the conflict, the climate, and the COVID shocks to kind of summarize it, particularly in, in, in today's, uh, in 2021 and 2022 uh, terms. Next slide, please. What I will do now, I'm, I will go uh, through a couple of slides related to uh, through the impact of COVID-19. And then I will also turn at the end uh, to some discussions of the impact of the current crisis, the, the conflict crisis, the, the Ukraine war, how that is affecting global food markets. In terms of COVID-19, IFPRI has done a lot of work on this. And so what I will present is a combination of, of some of our global modeling work, some country level analysis, uh, both simulation work and, and actually survey-based work with, with data collected from, from the field. Um, this is our... Uh, this is an updated uh, simulation uh, 
predictions. And so we've seen there that the, there was a very significant effect on global poverty, mostly through the declines of uh, incomes and, and job losses that, that occur, particularly among on poor people. And there, the one thing which is uh, interesting there is that initially we had uh, expected that Sub-Saharan Africa would be affected much stronger than, than South Asia. And that prediction has, has been, we had to revise these numbers because of a number of developments that occurred. And, and still until today, I think we have to be careful predicting these things to the future because of there's a lot of things related to COVID that we still do not fully understand. What we see on the right-hand panel, and this has been strongly consistent with, with observation and reality in, in survey data, which I will show in a second, is that you see what an economist would expect, which is a shift if incomes decline, you see a shift from uh, more nutritious foods, such as fruit and vegetables, uh, some of animal products, to uh, more basic foods, uh, staples. And that is what our models predict. And this is also what we've seen in reality. Another factor that contributed to that is that, particularly in the fruits and vegetable area, but also in, for example, milk, etc., these are very perishable products. And therefore, they have been more affected by supply chain disruptions. Next slide, please. Um, the way that poor people's food and nutrition security is, is affected, this disproportionate effect, there's a number of factors behind this. One is obviously one factor that everybody knows very well, they spend the largest share of their income on food, therefore income uh, affects, income declines, immediately affect their food security situation much, much more uh, problematic. The other reason is that Poor people really have their main asset is physical labor. So it's difficult for different from other, from more people with higher incomes who typically have assets such as capital, they may have lands, they may have houses, they may have factories. Okay. And so in order to gain income, they have to go out and work. And so this work, the physical labor has been affected both by the disease itself as by the restrictions to constrain the disease. So they have been, this is the factor most uh, and disproportionately affected actually the input factor during COVID. At the same time, we've seen disruptions both in the private food value chain. So basically businesses and trade being disrupted as, as you well know. And at the same time, we've seen that uh, social and social programs, which often include the nutrition component have also been uh, disrupted. And this of course affects poor people again, more than, than wealthier people. They also have less uh, access to health services, which played obviously a role. And then especially even within the poor group or some groups, for example, people had to travel um, either to the cities or abroad to gain uh, uh, income. So that's what's referred to as, as ex-migrants. Uh, Next slide, please. Uh, here are some data from uh, observations from work in, in Ethiopia and East Africa, and this is in urban areas. And there you see that the, um, uh, the two factors which we had simulated and so is really consistent with, with our observations here, which is on, on the left-hand panel, you see that the poorest people have indeed suffered more from income declines than middle income groups and, and higher income groups. And on the right-hand panel, you see that the, uh, the, uh, the reduction in, in healthier foods, and so in, in this part of the world, in Ethiopia, for example, um, dairy products consumption associated with, with healthier diets uh, was already lower uh, before COVID-19 and has been affected more in the uh, poor and middle-income countries than it has uh, among uh, richer, more wealthier households. Next slide, please. We also see here is two uh, sets of um, slides from, uh, from the impact on, on uh, public services on food programs. This is from a study that we did in, in uh, Uttar Pradesh in India. And there you see uh, two different effects. One is that the, on the, the, the decline in services after uh, COVID-19 hit. So that's going from the, the, the blue bars, which was uh, before and the uh, and the uh, sorry and and the green and the yellow bars uh, after covid one is in april the other one's in, in in june and in the summer and you see very significant reductions in the uh, immunization services growth monitoring counseling etc very important uh, services which are being provided to the poor the one thing that where the um, 
where the indicator goes up is in uh, public distribution of food. And this is a welcome sign. It's also something we see in many different countries that actually food distribution services, some of the social programs have played a very important role in uh, addressing the, the problems related to, to, uh, to COVID-19. Okay, and see there the impact has gone up actually. And so we've seen also expanding on social programs globally. Next slide, please. The next slide tells a similar story, but from uh, this is from Nigeria, and there you see uh, two things. One is that the uh, this is about school feeding services, and you see that the left hand uh, columns are all lower or than or smaller than the right hand columns. So the pre-COVID um, impact uh, situation in terms of skipping a meal, having less than enough to eat, is uh, was less a problem before COVID than after COVID. One also sees that the differences between the blue and the green bars is uh, small on the right hand side, which meaning that these programs were uh, not working very well anymore post COVID or in the period that we measured it compared to the pre COVID situation where there's clearly a difference in households having access to food, school feeding services and those are not. Next slide. What we've also seen, and this is a, uh, observed, and this is a, across the board, is that women are especially vulnerable. They're especially vulnerable for a number of reasons. One is that um, the health measures are affecting uh, genders differently. Income shocks are affecting genders differently. And then uh, particularly important from a dynamic perspective, from a longer term perspective, is that empowerment and access to schooling are uh, negatively affected and this we know very much that that um, that these things have a long run effect which are uh, arguably more important than the short run effect because of skills of children are particularly girls cannot go to school this is affecting their their opportunities in the labor market and, and a whole set of of related factors later in life so that means if we design uh, programs, policy programs, that we should anticipate these uh, or take into account these gendered effects and also adjust our, our programs in order to target uh, these specific uh, differences among gender group. And this, of course, can also sometimes it, all, it also applies to different social groups, not just uh, uh, gender. Next slide, please. Here are some data from our work in, in Myanmar, and there we find indeed that uh, the Rural female headed uh, households are significantly more negatively affected by reduction. This is about reductions in international remittances, which is a very important source of income in, uh, in Myanmar and rural Myanmar. And we see that the impact there on rural female headed households is significantly larger than on uh, other households, uh, uh, male uh, headed households in this case. Next slide, please. This slide summarizes kind of our global, we have a, a data set at FP now where we collect information systematically on the importance of uh, social programs, social protection programs. And what we have seen is that, uh, well, we know that these programs can take a variety of forms. They can be um, basically utility bill support, wage support, food aid support, and, and variety of things. But we've seen globally that these have expanded significantly either by introducing them in regions where they were not existing before or in cases where they did exist basically expanding their scope and then then their width in terms of reaching reaching more households than they were doing before and so this is potentially a very important a dynamic um, has a potentially dynamic of important dynamic effect because it may have uh, it may persist over time and i think that's that's again that's a really important uh, potentially positive development next slide please um, on, there's been a, a lot of discussion and a lot of analysis on the impact on, on, the, on the supply chain. There, I think, are um, overall, I should say, that there is, there is um, what we have seen, what we have observed, is probably a bit more a po a positive or less, uh, let's say, uh, less negative than what we had predicted initially. So initially, there was a lot of media reports as well about supply chains which had broken down. Uh, food which was left in, 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 in the field to rotten, uh, trucks which were stopped at borders, etc. But there's been a lot of innovation in these supply chains and innovation in a number of ways in terms of both social innovation, technical innovation, institutional innovation. We've seen rapid growth of, of digital technology, 
even in, in, in very poor countries, but particularly in, in the lower middle income countries, where they have grown very much, uh, but also institutional innovation. We've seen school feeding programs, for example, on, on the public side, where uh, teachers and, and people in the villages, uh, cooperatives have gotten together and tried to reorganize them so that even they get uh, con could continue to work in, in a different setup. There is a lot of heterogeneity, obviously, whether these are global and local, capital intensive or labor intensive. Again, labor intensive supply chains have been much more affected, I would say. And then long run versus short run staples versus perishable. All these things play a role, but I think in general, the supply chains have been more resilient than we had predicted uh, at the very start of the, uh, uh, of the pandemic. Next slide, please. Here is a uh, result from a survey that we did in Myanmar. Uh, and here, these numbers are actually consistent with, with that argument that when we ask the household, what does really affect or how are these various factors affecting you? What we see there is that the, the loss of income, the loss of job is really much more important as a cause for, for problems in the households uh, compared to supply chain disruptions. Okay, and so this is very much in line with, with the arguments we uh, I made earlier and also some of our findings in other countries that is really that COVID, the, the worst part of the COVID impact is actually an economic shock in terms of income loss and, and job loss. Next slide. This is, uh, and, and, and these um, results are actually consistent with that. This is the, um, and our estimates of the increases in, in poverty and uh, the in, in a number of countries, three different countries there. And there are, and on the left-hand side, you see changes in, in GDP along the value chain. So this is changes in, in output and value added along the line, along the, the value chain. And so these, uh, the numbers on the left-hand side are for Indonesia, but the number for the other countries are, are similar. And so we see that the, um, the total effect, okay, and this is estimated for a five or a six month period of, of, of basically of, of uh, uh, very strict COVID uh, restrictions. They will see the total effect is large. It's almost 40%. The agri-food sector is about half of that, around 18%. And then you see that farming itself so is, is affected least along the value chains, okay? Because it's, it's in rural areas where there's significant distancing, Take, uh, that, that can be used in terms of the operations, et cetera. And so the further you go to the cities, if you want, the processing and particularly the services, uh, which have been the most heavily affected, there you see that the decline has been much stronger. And then if we translate that to the, or, or relate that to the observations where we see there's been relatively little difference between the increase in poverty between urban areas and rural areas, and that is related to this, this difference effect along the value chain in the sense that the services, which were very much uh, relatively more important in the cities, uh, have affected uh, incomes much stronger there. And so that farming, despite the negative effect, has survived or has been able to continue to a better, uh, a less negative uh, effect uh, extent. And that there is a trade off there. Okay. So, in the sense that rural areas were relatively less affected than urban areas, but at the same time, most of the poor people live in rural areas uh, more so than in urban areas. So, these two factors kind of offset each other or combine in terms of that the net effect in terms of poverty have been, has been similar in urban and, and rural areas. Next slide, please. Let me then say something about a trade and value chains, actually linking back to what I just said. Okay, we know that going forward, um, food trade is, is going to be really important, be it inside the country, between different regions, or in a case like India, it's, it's a huge uh, country, of course, uh, between uh, different parts, even different uh, urban and rural areas, and of course, internationally as well, okay? And so in order to, to protect against, uh, make the, the system more resilient, trade can play a very, uh, very important role, okay? It can also play in a disruptive role, depending on where the source of the, of the shock occurs, and that's important to realize as well. Next slide. What we have seen, and this is a normal reaction, and, and so this is very recent uh, results which come out of the work that, that some of our experts at IFPI are doing, and so they have now put together this data set on, on, um, on trade interventions. This work by David Laborde and Joe Glauber, Rob Foss and their team. And on the, uh, the 
this is the number of countries implementing food export restrictions and, and their associated share in global trade of calories. So let's look at the bottom part of the picture. So that's the number of countries implementing food export restrictions. And this is for three different shocks that we have seen over the past um, 15 years, really. So the, uh, the red one is the current Ukraine crisis. The blue one is with COVID-19, the first year of COVID-19. And the orange one is with the 2008 um, food price spikes on, on the food crisis, then on global markets. And so what you see is that in 2008, many countries introduced, uh, introduced export restrictions. And so it's kind of interesting that it all happened in the beginning of the years and import uh, restrict, uh, sorry, export restrictions, and they persisted through much of, of the year of 2008. What we've seen with COVID-19 is that the same thing happened. A lot of export restrictions were initially introduced when there was talk about shortage on, on global markets, but these have been uh, reduced quite soon afterwards. And I think uh, international organizations such as the, the World Bank, the World Economic Forum, the G20, et cetera, IFPRI, FAO, et cetera, have played a role in that in the sense that they could uh, predict much better how much food there was available in storage around the world. Also say, listen, in 2008, we did the wrong thing. We made the situation worse, so we should not be doing that. And governments have responded by, by basically gradually uh, redu removing again the export restrictions. The red line is what's happening right now. And there you see in response to the current Ukraine war that you see a very strong increase in uh, in export restrictions as well and we are now uh, out there arguing that we should be be careful about doing this things are going to get worse because of this export restriction and try to get kind of a, a blue line effect uh, going forward as well next slide i have uh, a few, two slides here on, on on food standards okay this in itself is an entire lecture and i, I don't have time to go into great detail on it but i just want to point out that the Certainly going forward, and I think COVID-19 plays a role in this, but certainly also when we start thinking about climate change, sustainability standards, etc., food standards are going to be, if anything, much more important in the future than they have been in the past. And here you see that over the past 20 years, food standards have, have grown tremendously. This is one indicator of that. It's SPS notifications to the WTO and global gap certification. This is done. These are the global gap. GAP stands for good agricultural practices. These are certifications implemented by global supply, uh, global retailers, etc., for their supply chains. So these are affecting rich and poor farmers um, simultaneously. Uh, next slide. So what standards do? Okay, standards can be good. Okay, standards can be catalysts to trade, to sustainability, to poverty reduction because they can reduce market imperfection, reduce negative externalities. But at the same time, they can also create additional trade barriers, et cetera. And what we see empirically is that they are used for both things. They're used for good things and for bad things. And so this is uh, makes it a very complex issue. Also, it's very hard to identify when the standard is used for, <laughs> for a good uh, reason and for a bad reason. And so that makes it a very difficult thing to, to deal with internationally. I have one more slide on this, which is that this is from a study that we did with the next slide, please, uh, for the European Commission in uh, two years ago. And there uh, we reviewed the complaints that have been submitted against SPS notification at the WTO. And there what you see is that the same countries which are uh, complaining the most about it are also the countries who are receiving the most uh, complaints against them for using SPS. So it's a very mixed story here in terms of, of those who are engaged in, 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 uh, in, in, in using SPS a lot. They are both complaining that other countries are using it for trade barriers, but are also receiving a lot of complaints that they are. What's interesting there is there's very few poor countries there. There are some middle income countries. And you see that India is, uh, is actually quite active on the right hand panel and, and basically submitting a number of complaints that their trade has been hurt by uh, SPS uh, uh, rules being introduced by other countries. So I think these things are going to become much more important, particularly if we think about global sustainability standards and, and, and the external externalities of, of domestic standards, etc. Next slide, please. 
I have um, a few slides here at the end. At the, this is the last part of the presentation on what's happening in Ukraine and global food security. I think these numbers most of you know by now. Both Russia and Ukraine play a very important role in, in basically in exports of, of staple commodities and calories, if you want them. Mostly uh, wheat is obviously a very important factor, uh, about 6% each. And there you see that the, uh, the evolution of, of uh, wheat, corn, and soybean prices have been going up very significantly in, uh, in the past uh, year or two years. Next slide. What we see, though, is that there was already a very high increase in uh, significant increase in food prices. And if you look at the real food prices, you see that the uh, the level there was actually higher than it has been in, in 2008. And that was prior to the, the, the Russian invasion in, in, in Ukraine. OK, if you look at the, the global stocks there, so the two lines are um, so they relate to the the. The left line, that's the 2008 situation, okay, where we had the global price spikes. And there on, on the right-hand side, this is the, the most recent years, you see that the rice situation is actually better than in 2008, the rice stocks. But all the other ones are in a worse situation right now than they were at that point. So this is a uh, cause for a lot of concern, particularly in the, uh, let's say, in the non-rice uh, markets, if you want. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, their import, their share is uh, unequally distributed globally. We know that. Uh, I'm sure you know this as well. It's particularly the countries closest to Russia and Ukraine, which are most dependent, obviously, on their exports. And you see that in barley, maize, sunflower, wheat, and, and sunflower oil, these are really important uh, global players. And it depends, again, the, the geographic distribution is, is, uh, is concentrated. Next slide, please. Um, this is an example from Egypt, which is hugely dependent at this point on exports, uh, on imports from, from those two countries, about 85% of their wheat, and wheat is really an important staple commodity in Egypt, is coming from, from those two countries. The dynamic effects, or let's say the more medium-term effects, next slide please, will uh, also come through fertilizer markets. Uh, there is a very important fertilizer component there. Here, uh, I just summarize it. This is the, the, <clears throat> the slide for the last 15 years. And I think the, the key point here is that there's been three major uh, price spikes now over the past uh, 15 years. And so that means that we may be in a new situation of, of, of what the norm is. So the norm seems to be instability rather than, than stable uh, markets here. And so uh, why may the situation be more difficult now than it was uh, even before in the, in the price spikes? The poor, as I explained, are still recovering from the COVID crisis. Hunger and, and malnutrition were already on the rise, as I also showed in the beginning. And uh, COVID has not only affected households and, and private people, individuals, but is also affecting obviously governments, which had spent a lot of money on enhanced infrastructure, enhanced uh, uh, health measures to deal with COVID-19. And obviously it's unclear how long this is going to last. Next slide, please. Uh, these are the most recent data. And there you see that in the recent weeks now, price increases have slowed down a bit or have stabilized. And the one on the right, the slide on the right, the green line there is for rice. And you can clearly see that the rice prices are, are, are basically behaving very differently from maize and wheat prices because, uh, yeah, Russia is and, and, and Ukraine are, are wheat and, and maize exporters and not uh, rice export. And again, I think the, the, the storage situation, the stock situation of the rice market is better than in the other countries and uh, the other cereals. Next slide, please. Uh, here's the fertilizer and fuel prices. Here we see that the, um, again, that this is, they have increased very strongly as well. They are very important exporters, Russia and then Belarus. And Belarus is also subject to, to, ex, to sanctions from, from uh, mostly the Western world. And they are, the dependence on these differs again geographically. But you see that, for example, um, so the countries in Asia are somewhat less uh, dependent on, on, on those fertilizers than the countries in Africa, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, where they are very dependent on it. Next slide. Um, so the question is, 
this is a really an, out, an, an outstanding question in the sense that the answer we have to, to work on the, is that what, what is the most important factor here for food prices and, and for the poor? Is it the commodity prices? Is it the fertilizer prices? Or is it the oil prices going forward? At this point, there, the three of them are very highly co uh, correlated. Okay, so in a way, it, one could say it doesn't really matter because they're all high. So, and, and think, but you know, we know now that even in, in let's say low and middle income countries, a large, the commodity prices are only making up something like 25% on average of uh, consumer food prices. So that makes that 75% or 70% on average, okay, of the food prices is by non, it's not going to the farmer, it's not the commodity prices, but it's something else, okay? And so that means that potentially the oil prices may be just as important going forward affecting food prices than the, uh, or even more, than the commodity prices are. But as I said, since they're so correlated right now, it's an, it's kind of more, a, if you want, a, an academic issue than uh, at this point than, than uh, the, the reality. But obviously, that may change in the future. Next slide, please. Uh, so here already, I made this point already, are price shocks and volatility, are this going to be the new normal? Does that mean we have to make resilience the center of our, our global food policy going forward or the, the national food policies as well, rather than um, thinking about high versus low, uh, but more thinking about volatility versus stability? And this brings us back to a debate we've had goes back to the 1950s. There was a debate on, on these things and certainly also last decade, 2008, 2009, et cetera. And I think we need to bring this back on the table and, and see what are the implications of our policy. Next slide. This is my, uh, I think my last slide here on the, uh, so if we think about uh, resilience and inclusion, how to deal with them together, then I think we have to think about groups of measures, so measures to limit the frequency and the magnitude of the stock. So if they don't, the shocks don't occur and climate mitigation certainly fits in here, then you don't have to worry about the impact. The second group is measures that if the shocks are coming, be informed so you can anticipate the shocks. Okay, so this is early warning systems, digitalization, etc. are very important. And then the third group is measures to absorb the shock. So if the shocks hit, that you can deal with it. Insurance mechanisms, for example, play a, an important role in there. And so my last line there is on resilience and inclusion, that they're intrinsically linked. And I think if, if the food systems are not inclusive, that means that the poor are much more um, vulnerable to shocks. And therefore, that in itself will create instability in society. So and that does not is not conducive to a resilient uh, social system and therefore not a resilient food system. But I think we have to look at them very much as part of, 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 one, uh, of one unit, if you want, of, of thinking about this. On uh, the last two slides is just information about our IFPRI work, what we do and what you can find. Next slide, please. Here we have now a special blog series on the high food fertilizer price and war in Ukraine. We also have one still on COVID-19. You can visit all the information, all our work there is, is freely downloadable. And maybe for the analysts among you, next slide, we have a series of indicators which you are now collecting and we're putting, making available free of charge on our website. Again, so we have the food and fertilizer export restriction tracker, the early warning systems and vol on volatility, the stock use monitoring systems and the vulnerability dashboard and a series of things. So please do visit our website if you are would like to use these, these indicators. With that, I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to give the, the floor back to, to the chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Johan, uh, very much for this excellent talk, excellent analysis, excellent data interpretation which you have provided to our uh, esteemed audience. Uh, now, if you agree, and if the chairman agrees, uh, we can take up a few questions. Dr. John, can we take a few questions? Uh, the, the first question is uh, by Dr. Hedes, and he's asking whether the simulation model can accurately predict the poverty. Um, <laughs> that's a very difficult question. The, there, is a, there is a huge debate on, uh, on the, how to accurately measure poverty. I think our, 
I think our models are, are reasonably good in predicting the, 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 the direction of poverty, kind of the, the increases, declines, and, and the changes in it. Measuring the level of poverty is something where people have been working on for decades and are still discussing uh, quite a bit. I know that in Umalele's new book, there is a, a section on, on how to measure poverty and, and undernutrition and that these things are still... But I think the models are reasonably okay in terms of, of direct, measuring the impact of changes on, on poverty. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Dr. S.K. Chaudhary, our Deputy Director General, uh, is uh, uh, is uh, asking some questions. Uh, can you uh, uh, give the co-host permission uh, to Dr. Chaudhary, GDG and RM, a bit? Can you go ahead, Dr. Uh, in the meantime, I ask you uh, the, the, another question, which is by Dr. Aru. Why uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is not that much affected in comparison to South, South Asia? Yeah, and it, this was, um, well, essentially, we our initial predictions were much uh, larger for uh, Sub-Saharan Africa as well. And I think it's a mixture of things. So there is, there's a couple of papers out there now who are trying to estimate or trying to explain. Uh, so these are written by, by medical scholars as well. Why COVID has hit Sub-Saharan Africa less than people had predicted initially. And there is a number of hypotheses out and people, I think people don't really know for sure, but they have hypotheses out. Part of it, it has to do with uh, with the weather, part of it has to do with some form of resilience among the population uh, because of just the way they have uh, basically grown up among, uh, among infections. Uh, and there's a number of other hypotheses as well. And, um, but we had, uh, it was unpredicted. And so that's also why uh, one has to be careful. I also think that th there may still be a, a a chance that that COVID is hitting harder in, in, in Africa going forward. The vaccination rates are low still there on average. And so it's it's one has to be very careful in this area, I think. But clearly the impact has been less than we had predicted initially. Uh, okay. And now the, the next question is by uh, another audience, Dr. Mohapatra, S.D. Mohapatra. Although the per capita food availability is increased globally, the most challenging task is availability of uh, clean, healthy food. What will be your uh, message to the researchers in this direction? Sorry, can you repeat the question, please? I, I didn't quite get He's it. He's asking, although the per capita food availability is increased globally, the most challenging task is availability of clean, healthy food. What will be your message to the researchers in this uh, direction? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's actually, that's correct. Okay, so it's a very, um, it's, if you look at the numbers, okay, we are really not going into the right direction. And this is very challenging. And it's a big challenge for all of us. And so clearly there is an income element there that we see very clearly, both from COVID and from uh, uh, the other crises that we observed now. And so there the focus should be on income at the same and so to increase access. But I think there's also an issue of institutions um, of, uh, for example, the food standards I referred to. So I think it's a, it's a mixture of different measure, uh, measures that need to, to be taken uh, in this area. I also think that, for example, the thinking about healthy diets and not just about the uh, or access to healthy diets and not so reducing hunger in terms of calories is a big thing. And that's affecting both, I think, our private food system and our public food system uh, equally. Thank you. Uh, Arpit, can you uh, make co-host uh, Dr. Chaudhary, please? Okay. Uh, in the meantime, uh, uh, let, let us say one or two more questions. Uh, Food production is continuously increasing, per capita availability uh, is sufficient. Even government are having different public food distribution programs. Uh, even then, what are the reasons why people, few people are still far from getting the sufficient food? Um, can you repeat the, the last point of what you said? Uh, he's asking, even governments are having different uh, public food distribution programs. Even then, what are the reasons why few people are still far from 
getting sufficient food yeah i think part of it well obviously because the <laughs> there are so many people to serve right and so and so the government cannot do everything so i think the private sector and the public sector have to play a very comp complementary role i mean just expecting that the government uh, sector will take care of everything i think is not not uh, very realistic uh, also much of these government programs have been designed in, in in previous days and so i think they need to 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 adjust also i think to the new reality and um and maybe there's just some uh, covid left effects that it makes uh, it hard to actually target the new groups that need uh, government uh, programs and have not been well identified. I know that in several cases we've, we've seen, even in the US, uh, I've seen some recent data where restricted government funds can only be used in certain way. And so the issue of implementation costs become really uh, crucial in terms of targeting uh, the right audiences there or the right, um, uh, audience is not, not the right word, the, the right households and, and the right uh, social groups and, and economic groups. Uh, we, we take uh, uh, one last question, and uh, that is India could avert uh, food crisis because of its buffer stocks and public distribution system, and also ensure uh, food security of its neighboring countries. Given this, should we, uh, should we not re revisit the rules of WTO, uh, raising limit on support under Amber Box 2? Uh, revising the support base from uh, 86 to 88. That is the question by Dr. P. S. Birthal, who is working in our uh, economic institute. Yeah, I know there is a long-standing discussion between. Uh, if I recall, I mean, I used to do a lot of work on trade in uh, my younger days. I haven't followed the most recent discussion. I know there is a uh, a discussion between India and some other. <laughs> On, on the role of stocks and how they should be treated in the WTO. And so uh, maybe this is a good moment with all the, 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 the price fluctuations that are going on right now in terms of the making the trade-off between or, or reviewing again the trade-off between holding stocks and uh, the, the global trade system and, and the policies there and to see to what extent there needs to be a revision of that or to what extent... I mean, we've seen in Europe, for example, the, the level of support to farmers has not gone down over the past 25 years, but the way farmers have been supported has been much, is much more efficient, I think, right now than it used to be, much less distortive. And maybe we can also look at the, the, the system, for example, in India and also in other countries from that angle, like how can we at the same time make sure that the, the security in terms of the buffer function is there and still make it make trade and markets maybe uh, work better alongside it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we take last question from Dr. Chaudhary. He's our Deputy Director General of Natural Resource Management. Dr. Chaudhary, please. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, Johan, thank you and congratulations for a wonderful presentation. It was uh, uh, a pleasure and it was a treat to listen to you during this uh, 40, 40, 40, 45 minutes. My question is very specific to present day fertilizer scenario. The fertilizer scenario, which is emerging now after this uh, Russia-Ukraine war is really worrisome. Uh, it is worrisome not only for India and South Asia, but uh, the world as a whole, uh, because we have some alternative with us, but many countries, they do not have any alternatives to go ahead with particularly the potassium fertilizers. India's dependence on potassium is very high on other countries. Uh, as well, nitrogen fertilizer, our dependence, at least 40% uh, dependence is there on other countries where we import either gas or some raw material. Uh, now, uh, my question is, uh, uh, in this present day context, how agriculture will emerge in coming next four or five years? Because these two years uh, uh, impact of war, as well as the COVID situation and lockdown for last two years, uh, already industries have suffered. Uh, the supply of fertilizer in many countries was not uh, as per their requirement. And now, uh, on top of that, this war has really uh, broken the backbone of agriculture in many countries because potassium fertilizer number is very costly. 
And secondly, uh, some of the countries, um, I would not name here, some of the countries, they are make, taking advantage of the situation. They want to make money. And uh, the other countries are suffering. I'm, what I'm kind sorry, of I don't hear much? Dr. Chaudhary anymore. Yeah. Do you hear? Yes, Dr. John? Are you not able to listen to me? I heard the first part of the question or the comment. Um, yeah. My first part was uh, the present day fertilizer scenario, which is emerging, oh, the potential. Maybe I have to log up and log on again. Something is wrong, it seems. Uh, any problem, uh, Dr. John? Uh, can, Dr. Chaudhary, can you just uh, put in brief yeah. uh, your question yeah. so that he can understand straight away? Put your question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think he's out. Uh, hmm. uh, maybe he's disconnected. So that's why he was not. Uh, and now he's again back. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. Make him uh, co host, Dr. Johan Sunan. I have put my question in a bridge form now. Dr. John, unmute, please. I'm sorry, I hear you now again. I just, I don't know what happened. There wasn't a disruption here. Yeah. In the chat box, he has his question. Uh, just in chat this box. Chaudhary. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's a very... Um, um, oh, it's a very difficult question. Huh? I mean, at this point, it's really hard to be optimistic, I think. Um, the, uh, it, it's hard to predict as well, because it's so hard to predict how long the war is going to last and, and the disruptions there. The, um, in a way, the, the trade, in, in, uh, at least in terms of institutional infrastructure, the trade in, in, in fertilizer, could be easier to, to recover if you want than uh, if it lasts for a while. For example, the Ukrainian wheat uh, harvest is, is really not coming true. Um, but the, the dynamics, I think, in terms of the, the global markets are really potentially much more important through the fertilizer effect than to the current, uh, than the food disruptions effect, uh, because it's affecting so many more countries in the world. And, uh, and because it is much harder, I think, to, to, uh, to deal with it in, in the medium run. So I, am, I think we should be thinking very hard in terms of alternative uh, models, in terms of also obviously alternative supply routes, et cetera. And, but already now the prediction I have seen is that people are, um, are telling that the, the food prices are likely to be gonna be high for the next not just in this year, but also next year and a year afterwards, at least because of these dynamic uh, spillover effects. Yeah. So I, I don't have a very good answer to your question. I think all of us are looking at this carefully and and uh, and thank so you. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. John, and thank you, Dr. Chaudhary, for this question. Now I request uh, the chairman of this session, uh, Secretary Dare and DG ICR, uh, Dr. Tiruchan Mahapatraji, uh, to give his uh, remarks, concluding remarks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Agrawal, and uh, thanks, uh, profuse thanks to Dr. John Sunin uh, for an excellent uh, lecture on transforming global food system after COVID-19. Uh, in fact, uh, it was a treat. Uh, so many complicated facts explained with simple figures and diagrams. And after a thorough uh, intensive analysis, in-depth analysis, uh, and explaining those with the facts and figures, it was a real treat, uh, Dr. Sunin. And uh, we thoroughly enjoyed, uh, you know, your incisive, uh, you know, um, deliberation on a very complex issue and that too at a global scale 
and taking uh, uh, over, giving overall picture and taking some examples country wise uh, and uh, uh, presenting before us uh, you know those uh, scenarios uh, particularly post covid and uh, how we were trying to uh, you know uh, improve and then uh, conflicts in the form of uh, uh, ukraine uh, russia war uh, comes in and then uh, again uh, you know uh, impacting uh, very very significantly uh, the whole uh, situation uh, going again negative uh, so uh, over a uh, kind of learning experience for all of us and i'm sure all my colleagues uh, honorable vice chancellors of various universities and uh, scientists colleagues uh, students faculty uh, uh, and all uh, you know enjoyed this very briefly i'll uh, summarize now the five minutes and uh, you know uh, the kind of uh, uh, issues you highlighted uh, you know that speaks that we the the problem is uh, still continuing and we have to be careful uh, poverty increase as you said and somebody raised this point in south asia versus sub saharan africa and uh, you know the how it has behaved uh, and uh, uh, how much increase uh, has happened uh, you know that is something uh, we have to worry about uh you know uh, why uh, you know uh, our uh, uh, measures uh, in terms of you have sub subsequently described that taking a couple of uttar pradesh that how uh, you know it has impacted particularly the public distribution system and how it has actually helped uh, so we have to see in the south asia context uh, that uh, how poverty has uh, increased and certainly you have given Uh, reasons uh, that uh, you know uh, what all happened uh, uh, the uh, uh, food expenses because job loss happened and uh, rightly so uh, you know reverse migration taking place uh, from cities uh, back to villages and uh, many returned without anything at villages and government tried to a package called atmanirbhar bharat self reliant india and a number of measures were taken uh, you know in india but uh, similar situation may not be there in other countries as much as they were there in india and certainly job loss impacted uh, you know expenses on food rightly you have pointed out and uh, i'm sure uh, that decline uh, of uh, uh, in expenses on food items uh, leading to uh, you know uh, uh, negative impacts on nutrition uh, as a whole uh you know uh, so that's uh, very clearly highlighted and uh, uh, you know revealed from your presentation a uh, food chain getting disrupted uh, you know in many countries uh, you know very significantly the public distribution systems not operating as effectively and access to health services also not very effective in many countries uh, you know uh, india produce vaccines supplied vaccines to many countries and also uh, you know uh, millions and millions of people you know getting vaccinated not once twice even thrice now with booster dose and uh, that is a very significant one for india but i think uh, you know that uh, uh, is an issue as issue in many countries uh, very um, uh, you know important point that you highlighted is the vulnerability of the children uh, of children and uh, women Uh, due to uh, covid and so impact of covid uh, is there uh, very rightly said uh, and you said impact of for the uh, you know uh, covid in ethiopia for instance the poorest uh, getting impacted maximum so the poverty uh, and impact of covid uh, you know being maximum there and uh, the problem getting accentuated further so uh, and poverty increasing Uh, as a result of that so that's uh, that's uh, you know the story uh, that you have actually described and similarly in nigeria you know not getting enough meal and uh, running out of food 
and uh, leading to skipping of meals and so on and so forth. Various uh, parameters you have highlighted how COVID has really impacted uh, very negatively uh, the whole population. And women, as I said, being most vulnerable. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, once one looks at the data of uh, uh, men versus women with regard to health and also, uh, you know, uh, children, uh, you know, particularly school going children and getting impacted maximum, uh, staying at home, attending online courses and uh, not very effective uh, teaching happening and learning happening, though teaching was quite effective in terms of communication using online methods, but this aspect probably needs analysis uh, that, uh, you know, learning also was not very effectively happening actually. Uh, so this uh, requires uh, a deeper analysis. Uh, of course, uh, the income shocks, uh, as you described uh, in uh, several countries, including uh, Myanmar, uh, you know, income declining uh, and so on and so forth and job loss uh, um, happening uh, impacting, uh, you know, many, many different sections. Uh, supply chains, again, uh, you know, getting disrupted. Uh, similarly, in Indonesia, uh, rural uh, people getting impacted more than the urban. An obvious reason, obvious reason that rural getting more impacted, uh, you know, as compared to urban. Uh, 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 and then you did a comparison with farming, processing services, how differentially getting impacted because of COVID and, uh, you know, how services getting impacted uh, and uh, severity of that and very nicely depicted with uh, a very good analysis and uh, telling us that, uh, you know, uh, this is how uh, things can complicate because of a pandemic situation. And uh, uh, we didn't see a pandemic of this dimension uh, uh, you know, uh, in uh, recent history and in our lifetime, only all of us, uh, we saw this first time. And, uh, you know, certainly uh, it is uh, uh, far and wide and all across the globe and uh, uh, getting, uh, you know, impacted. So this is, uh, this. there are several, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, lessons to learn from the analysis that you did. And obviously uh, we can do further analysis and go deeper uh, region-wise. And in fact, in India, we would be very happy to actually do this further because you know, overall pictures, and as you rightly said, India is very complex. And uh, the Uttar Pradesh state that we have chosen for analysis is a concern you know, in terms of population, in terms of diversity. And uh, imagine other, uh, several other states. And so probably we need to really do a similar kind of analysis to understand you know, the COVID impacts and how uh, the food system uh, and uh, agriculture and agriculture in this country has uh, grown so well, more than 3.5% growth uh, despite COVID. Uh, and, uh, you know, very importantly, even fishery and, uh, you know, uh, animal husbandry, uh, you know, particularly the dairy sector, uh, growing close to 6%. I and mean, that's something very, very interesting. And, uh, you know, although we expected disruptions there, but things moved quite uh, well. Uh, even, even horticulture sector also are doing uh, good. Uh, so our total production increasing uh, and uh, productivity has in, uh, increasing. Uh, so, so that's something which is, uh, you know, in our case, uh, you know, uh, presenting a bit different, uh, you know, kind of uh, situation. And in the process, we are able to, you know, not only increase our export, but also provide free food, uh, you know, through PDS uh, to more than uh, 800 million people. I mean, that's something which is, and for several months. Uh, so, so that's uh, the kind of situation which was uh, here. And uh, equity, uh, you know, uh, all uh, taken into account uh, to, uh, you know, support the poor, uh, most vulnerable uh, class of people here, uh, and particularly those who returned home uh, uh, through because of reverse migration. So that uh, you know was uh, taken care. But certainly, when the shocks uh, and uh, you know uh, were uh, to be uh, observed, uh, then comes this uh, you know conflict, and you have rightly uh, you know how conflict has uh, impacted 
you know, uh, various aspects, the trade, uh, the, the uh, food systems, value chains, and the food standards and the SPS, you have taken the kind of numbers, you know, the graphical that you presented, how it has increased over times and uh, during war particularly. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, the, these uh, standards could be catalytic, as you said, at times could be prohibitive uh, with regard to trades and uh, could, uh, could place restrictions. Uh, so, so it could be uh, both ways, but depends, uh, you know, in which region, how they are treated uh, and uh, for what purpose they are treated. And we have seen the purpose uh, matters, uh, standards on their own, uh, you know, are useful, they are required. We need to really maintain food safety is so crucial and important. Consumers are becoming more and more, more, and more conscious of, uh, uh, you know, safe and nutritious food globally. And so also in India. And, uh, you know, I believe that, uh, you know, these standards, we have also a standard authority, which uh, keeps some, uh, you know, uh, setting these standards. So they are all important, but how we use and uh, or misuse uh, to uh, you know uh, uh, safeguard one's own interest uh, you know uh, with regard to trade so so there are you know uh, kind of various complexities i'm not going to that uh, but certainly you know uh, that aspect is quite uh, you know uh, very interesting that what you presented uh, the uh, kind of uh, uh, trade which is uh, happening and you rightly pointed out the prices are increasing and uh, wheat and, uh, uh, and maize that you highlighted and contrasted that with rice. And because the rice production areas and trade areas, uh, they are not really impacted much while uh, wheat uh, and the maize uh, areas uh, and particularly the production which was happening and around 6% uh, you know, uh, sale uh, of global calorie, as you rightly said, by Russia and uh, you know uh, and uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, so so obviously you know war has uh, impacted in a big way, and as uh, it was highlighted, the fertilizer, potassium fertilizer, for instance, and the prices are rising, and certainly it is going to impact uh, agriculture, not just uh, you know uh, in a shorter term, but uh, maybe a little uh, longer term it would impact. Uh, it would not just impact agriculture. Uh, in fact, uh, it, it would impact even employment because uh, you know, a supply chain was operating and a number of people were employed uh, in the whole system. Uh, and then also uh, uh, there were uh, you know, kind of livelihoods and in incomes based on that. And you did mention that uh, oil price and food price are a consequence of that and how they are uh, getting impacted uh, because of the world and uh, because of the fertilizer fuel prices uh, increasing. Uh, so, uh, so you rightly said that the new normal is emerging and how long that will remain normal, we do not know. And certainly we hope that that new normal uh, would change for better uh, in shorter term or medium term uh, so that uh, agriculture, uh, agricultural production systems and sustainability of production systems uh, are not really impacted. Uh, you know, uh, uh, so COVID is relenting to a certain extent, and uh, uh, I'm sure uh, it would normalize within a maximum period of one year. Uh, you know, or maybe uh, you know, even this phase uh, in India, for instance. So, so I believe that it may not be uh, as lethal uh, as it was in the past. And though there are problems in China, as it appears, and China escaped earlier phases about this time, uh, you know, there are some concerns in China. So shutdowns are happening. Uh, so, the, uh, so there is a need, as you rightly said, that, uh, you know, we need to really address uh, this, uh, the uh, shocks uh, and uh, the volatility uh, which, are, which are there. Uh, of course, uh, our uh, uh, social, uh, you know, programs have to be scaled and have to be sustained. And this is a very, very important point you have highlighted. And that's the kind of message uh, from such lectures that we are receiving 
and uh, trying to communicate to appropriate authorities that the social uh, programs uh, uh, should be continued with regard to scaling and uh, uh, you know this sustenance is uh, you know sustaining uh, such programs is uh, very very important food aid uh, cash transfer that happened in india in fact uh, this cash transfer uh, direct benefit transfer what we call and uh, uh, you know uh, uh, 2000 rupees in one batch and then 6000 rupees per farmer per year and uh, you know in three phases so that has really helped the poor farmers in this country. And uh, uh, food price control, as you rightly pointed out, is also very, very crucial uh, for poor uh, to sustain and uh, those who have lost their jobs uh, to really survive. Uh, so, uh, so food aid uh, and food price control uh, and cash transfer, as you rightly said, uh, such measures uh, should be scaled and should continue and uh, should be replicated in countries as much as possible uh, wherever uh, such uh, problems uh, are existing. And restructuring supply chains and uh, food systems, uh, again, rightly pointed out that we have to see there are heterogeneity, as you rightly pointed out, uh, you know, uh, at global scale, if you see regional disparities are there. So obviously local localized solutions are to be there localized systems are to be adopted uh, and uh, you know uh, short to uh, short term to long uh, long run uh, you know approaches are to be adopted uh, and uh, uh, certainly uh, you know uh, staples uh, are important and perishables are far more important and with greater focus because the horticulture produce for instance would provide the much needed nutrition uh, so so uh, how do we really focus and then provide that. And as you rightly said, innovation should be key. And you did mention about digital uh, platforms and how increasingly we have used during COVID. Uh, and uh, it has really provided, uh, you know, not only uh, in uh, food supply system, marketing system, but also uh, in uh, edu agriculture education system. And, uh, you know, that's most crucial because one, if one loses two complete years, uh, you know, uh, then it is uh, really, uh, you know, killing a career. Uh, so, so two years, two, more than two years, and providing education using digital platforms and technologies, smart classrooms, and so on and so forth. So digital growth, and also that digital growth, encouraging youth to come back to agriculture and to adopt, uh, and also, uh, provide services using digital platforms. And that is increasing. That's a very good outcome of, a uh, positive outcome of this COVID. Uh, and, uh, you know, and it's increasing, uh, you know, uh, very significantly uh, uh, at this point. So the jobless youth coming back to agriculture and providing digital solutions to agriculture, bringing precision agriculture and reducing input use and bringing sustainability uh, you know, to the uh, uh, system. So I believe, uh, you know, uh, these are the important uh, points uh, to take note. And of course, uh, as you rightly said, measures uh, to limit the frequency and magnitude of shocks. I think this is very, very important. How do we really do this? You know, uh, many are natural, but, uh, you know, COVID-like situation, can we really predict when the next one is going to come and uh, you know how much of uh, data analytics we use and how much of uh, fundamentals we do innovative science we do uh, uh, in the in the wild uh, using the wild or the evolution models which are built now you know understanding those uh, models and deploying those models to predict what is going to happen in how many uh, uh, what is the time frame and when and how many years so i believe that would be useful uh, to define and design measures uh, to limit the frequency uh, or, and magnitude of such shocks. But more importantly, the shocks due to climate change, shocks due to conflicts like uh, Ukraine, Russia, requires a whole lot of efforts. And uh, there, our human interventions and intelligent strategic interventions are very, very crucial to reduce the magnitude uh, of uh, the, such shocks. And I'm sure 
uh, the majors uh, uh, be uh, informed majors and uh, informed majors requires scientific evidences and our all engagement uh, through our uh, programs at the international level and collaborative and complementary manner. If we work together, we should be able to provide uh, regionally and globally uh, scientific evidence-based uh, uh, you know, uh, informed uh, measures uh, to address the problems which are there and reduce shocks uh, and vulnerability uh, which is there and volatility that you see. And uh, you know, when we do that, certainly as you rightly said, we should be uh, put, putting measures in place so that we are able to observe uh, these shocks very effectively and the process improve upon our resilience with regard to uh, sustainable food systems and uh, nutrition, better nutrition outcomes, and also in the process, take into account the inclusivity and equity that's so important uh, in today's world. And that has been important in the past, more important in the, in the context of COVID and conflict and climate change, as you rightly uh, pointed out. So it was an excellent presentation. And these are the kind of lessons we learned from this. And thank you very much, Dr. Joan Swinnan, for joining us today in this uh, 75th years of India's independence, what is called as Azadika Amrut Mahutsa. Uh, so, so this, uh, you know, we have uh, 75 lecture series, and you are part of this, and we have learned so much. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, you know, let us give him a big hand, uh, you know, for his excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Agrawal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, sir, for nicely summarizing and giving the viewpoints of uh, our India, the ICR, what we are doing. So thank you, Dr. John, once again uh, for uh, delivering this excellent talk. And on behalf of the audience, uh, and on behalf of the Indian Council of Agriculture Research, on behalf of the state agriculture universities, I profusely thank you and the free uh, for making it possible to have your lecture, long awaited lecture. So thank you uh, all the audience uh, for uh, being connected in a big number today. And uh, we are having next lecture uh, probably on uh, 10th of May. So thank you once again. Namaskar. Thank so you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So this is an end. Thank you, sir.